stopping right now a moment okay there you are so now we are on record everything else is all right now only thing i need to see who all are there yes everybody is there almost everybody is there okay let's go on to our governors we had initially decided or rather we had gone through the first few pages but as a quick revision uh, what is a governor you should be able to explain and then the two types of governor that are there one is for auxiliary engines which maintains a constant speed and the purpose is to have a constant voltage being generated to ensure you have a constant voltage and frequency you need to have a constant rpm <coughs> so these governors are isochronous governors don't forget the name the governors which are used for constant speed are called isochronous governors and they are used on your auxiliary engines and they are used because you need a steady voltage and frequency in the case of the main engine you need the rpm of the engine to change various because you sometimes need half ahead you need slow ahead you need full ahead so accordingly the signal given to the governor will allow the governor to regulate the fuel okay so these are the two types of governors we'll be dealing with and if time permit a short description of electronic governors also i shall include not a very tough issue to enable a governor to enable function a governor must have a component which senses the actual speed and part which compares the actual speed and the set speed in other words what the engine is running with and what the engineer wants there are two different values like here this diagram explains it all the ordinary mechanical governor can be called a proportional controller in a closed loop control system this is what is called a closed loop that means within the circle now initially the engine is running at a certain speed and the output goes directly to the propeller from that output shaft you take a measurement and that measurement is actually the measured value of the rpm it's quite simple and that value is fed to the flyweight governor flyweight governor is a very most basic concept of a governor no engine really has a flyweight governor by itself except those old engine right now the engine are having much more attuned governors governors which have been improved upon and they are much more refined in their performance so flyweight governor is initially introduced to you so that you get a fair idea of what is the principle of its function so the measured value comes to the governor at the same time what the engineer wants he feeds in that information to the governor it is never that the engineer or the operator regulates the fuel himself it is he regulates the signal to the governor and the governor on the basis of the signal he gets on the basis of what is the engine rpm it is able to find the deviation between the two and then accordingly a correction of the deviation is sent to the fuel injection system the fuel injection system will increase the fuel or decrease the fuel in other words it will control the fuel rack of a bosch fuel pump or it will control the eccentric in the silzer fuel pump if you remember how the pumps work one is the bosch pump that is for main engine and one is the spill valve and suction valve control for the silzer pump now ultimately the governor what is it doing it is controlling the fuel racks similarly in the silzer pump it is controlling the rack which is going to control the position of the eccentric to make that lever work as and what how it is desired so that is the other side of the story right now we'll stick to our governor function so once the signal comes to the fuel injection system it will increase or decrease the fuel and thereby you will get a change in the rpm and once that output changes that is again fed back to the governor so much so that after a certain time what is being fed back to the governor and what is desired by the engineer is the same so that is the steady equilibrium position so there will be no increase or decrease of the fuel if the measured value and the desired value are the same okay 
and this desired value can be changed by the engineer by turning a hand wheel which again compresses a spring or decompresses a spring in the flyweight governor in reality we don't really go to the governor and change the tension of the spring with a hand wheel that control is done remotely either by a electric motor or by a pneumatic piston let's move on as in the diagram control action is dependent on output that means the speed of the propeller shaft this output is the feedback to the controller here controller is the same thing as governor the controller compares the measured value of the speed with the set or desired value that means what is the value coming from the propeller shaft and what the engineer wants so he gets two values so then the controller produces an output which is a function of the deviation in other words the difference between the measured value and the desired value it could be a output which will reduce the fuel or increase the fuel if you are running if your engine is running at full speed and the engineer wants to reduce the speed so he will slowly reduce the speed or the desired value so that value is again read by the governor and the governor knows what the feedback is it is getting that continuously so accordingly it will reduce the fuel to the engine in other words it will change the fuel rack position to decrease the fuel okay so this output is increase or decrease of fuel injection to op in injection to the engine to obtain the set speed ultimately the objective is to get a required speed of the propeller shaft which in turn will give you the speed of the ship okay so the governor gets a feedback from what is actually happening and what the engineer wants based on that it will decide on the corrective action in case there is a deviation okay the ordinary mechanical governor has two rotating flyweight supported on crank levers okay it has got two weights which are supported on crank lever your arm is like a crank lever if it is bent if it is bent it becomes like a crank lever okay these levers are held on pivots which are based on a revolving stool in other words both the weights are revolving because they are based on a circular or a horizontal stool the stool is again rotated through an engine drive i'll give you a diagram just now it becomes clearer if you see a diagram the stool is rotated through gear and the engine drive an axial thrust bearing enables the centrifugal force of the flyweight to balance against an adjustable spring force now if you see the crank angle of the flyweight when the flyweights move outwards due to centrifugal force it pushes up the bottom portion portion of the crank and this again is counterbalanced by a spring force in between you have a connection with the fuel control lever so depending on what is the equilibrium position between the spring force and the centrifugal force this fuel lever will have a certain position and that position will determine the quantity of fuel going into the engine and therefore the rpm okay an axial thrust bearing enables the centrifugal force of the flyweight to balance against an adjustable spring force okay a speeder rod which is also called the fuel control rod is attached to a collar moves up or down okay one more plate before we go to the diagram right now all these statements will not register on your mind so well but it would make sense to read it once and then when we come back i will get back to this plate again the speeder rod movement controls the fuel rack of the pump to regulate the fuel injected the radial position of the flyweights determines the speeder rod position a mechanical governor has to perform two separate functions one is to act as a speed measuring device 
Oof, I've done this so many times. I'm feeling sleepy. To act as a speed measuring device and B, to supply the required power to move the fuel control lever. So all this read up doesn't really register unless you see a diagram. So here is your diagram and I'm going to make it as big as possible. So if you have a question later, do put it down on the chat column and I will immediately try to address it. Now, this is the concept of a very basic mechanical governor. What does it consist of? Okay, initially it consists of two flyweights. Flyweights are two masses which can, which can move in either direction. Okay, so these arrowheads show that this is capable of moving in this side and well as that side. It is supported on a bell crank lever. A crank lever is a bent lever, that's all. And there are two of them. One is on this side and one is on this side. These are bell crank levers. And if you see, the bent part of the lever is settled onto a pivot. This pivot is based on a horizontal stool, all right? And that horizontal stool has a hollow space in the middle, which allows a rod to pass through. This rod is the fuel control rod. But let us, we'll come to this again later. So the stool, which has a hollow passage through it, has a gear wheel at the bottom. This is a gear wheel. And this gear wheel is connected with the engine drive. So when the engine is running, this will also be running. So this whole stool will be spinning. It will be spinning. And because of the spinning act, these two flyweights will move outwards. Okay? If they move outward, then the L part of the crank lever will move upwards. Now this movement upward is a force actually depending on how much of centrifugal force is imparted to those weights. Now this uh, L-shaped lever is going to push up from this point. But above these two points, there is an axial bearing or a thrust bearing. Axial bearing is also a thrust bearing. So this thrust bearing is actually allowing the stool to rotate also, the bottom supports of the L crank lever is allowed to rotate. One part of the thrust bearing is rotating. The upper part is not rotating. And it is supporting a collar which is bolted with a long rod. This bolted with the long rod means that this is the fuel control rod. Now, this collar here is kept under pressure by means of a spring. And that spring pressure can be adjusted by means of a hand wheel. Okay. Now at the equilibrium speed, at the equilibrium speed, the spring force S, you see spring is under compression. The spring force S acting on this collar, all right, is counterbalanced by the centrifugal force created by this L-shaped lever upward. So this axial bearing is helping it to rotate, but the upper part of the collar is not rotating. So the centrifugal force created by the flyweight upward is balanced by the spring force S downward. Here you look at here, the spring force S is equal to centrifugal force m omega squared r. Okay, m omega squared means the mass of the flyweights, the speed at which they are rotating, and the, uh, the, uh, the radius at which they are rotating. So this is creating a centrifugal force, and that force is translated through the L-shaped lever upward. And the downward force is the spring force. So at a state of equilibrium, the spring force and the centrifugal force will balance each other. That means they'll remain steady. And that steady position will determine the steady position of the fuel rack, fuel lever. This fuel lever goes and adjusts the fuel racks of all the pumps. So if there is a change in speed, now let us say there is a sudden increase in load. Increase in load means resistance to the propeller. If that is the case, 
the rpm is going to drop moment you put extra load on the shaft for rotating the rpm is going to drop moment the rpm drops these two flyweights will move inwards moment it moves inward this point will go downward in other words the spring force will overcome the centrifugal force and moment it goes down this rod will also come down if this rod comes down it is called the fuel control link if the rod comes down it is in the increasing of fuel you see this positive mark this is a positive of increase of fuel and negative is decrease of fuel so under the circumstances that i've been suffered why am i feeling so sleepy because i'm doing it so repeat six times i'm doing the same thing it become very boring for me so anyway so this rod will go down to increase the fuel if it goes up it will decrease the fuel all right so this is a basic concept of a mechanical uh, mechanical governor and uh, the speed of the engine is being taken through an engine drive over here through a bevel gear a, through a pinion gear and that pinion gear rotates the stool on which the flyweights are based on the flyweights are based at the l point or the junction point of the two cranks and that is pivoted so this flyweight is capable of moving in and out likewise the right hand side is also capable of moving in and out and thereby creating a force at the bottom from underneath and an upward force is created by a spring pressure in between there is a collar which holds the speeder rod so the speeder rod is at the mercy of the spring force and the centrifugal force so whatever force takes precedence in other words becomes more it will move in that direction if the over if the rpm has suddenly gone high that means the flywheel will move outwards if it moves outwards it will push against the spring force and come up and if it comes up it also brings the fuel lever up if it brings the fuel lever up you can see it is marked as negative that means fuel will be reduced to the engine okay so any questions on understanding the simple mechanical governor no questions let me see if there's any questions sir how do we decide upon adjustment of spring okay good question it depends on what the bridge wants actually so when the bridge gives on the telegraph slow ahead so we also from the engine room of course it is not bridge controlled it is engine room controlled controlled okay so the bridge gives the information to the engineer and the engineer controls the engine if necessary the control can be switched over to bridge and engineer simply fold their arms and watch inside the control room all the parameters all the movements of the, all the indicators then what happens when the bridge gives the movement it is actually giving the signal to the governor directly from the bridge that is whatever signal is given to the governor this spring over here now this hand wheel what you see is just the concept to make you understand how the spring can be compressed or decompressed in reality instead of having a hand wheel what we can have or in fact we can have a hand wheel only but with a bevel gear attached to electric motor so when that electric motor turns it will turn the hand wheel and the same function will happen so the signal from the control room is actually given in the form of a electrical signal to rotate the motor which in turn will rotate the hand wheel or if at all there is no hand wheel there is a nut over here so it will rotate the nut which in turn will compress or decompress the spring alternatively we can have a pneumatic piston over here and this pneumatic piston can compress or decompress the spring how do will that pneumatic piston do it by controlling the air pressure to that piston now from the control room you will only allow for more air or less air this is made possible through a special arrangement where which is a lever so that lever is directly graduated with the rpm 
So you want 50 RPM, you put it on 50 RPM. But what it is actually sending is an air pressure, a regulated air pressure going to that pneumatic piston, which will position the spring in such a way that the force will bring the fuel lever to a certain point where you will get 50 RPM. So these are all calibrated arrangements. If it is an electric motor, accordingly, the signal when you move to 50 RPM as per the lever, it is going to allow current to that motor to continuously rotate so that this wheel or hand wheel rotates to bring the spring position to a compression which will ultimately move this feeder rod to give the fuel pumps more fuel or less fuel and ultimately get the required RPM. So that is how the control is done. This is only a concept, the hand wheel. The actual signal is coming from the control room or from the bridge directly. The bridge and engine room control room have the same controls. Only thing, it is bypassed from the control room to the bridge or it is bypassed from the bridge to the control room. It's like that. So you can switch over to control room or you can switch over to bridge. Ultimately, what signals are being sent to the governor is the same. Okay. So how we decide upon adjustment of spring? That adjustment of spring is done by means of spring pressure. And that spring pressure is adjusted either by an electric motor, which will have a bevel gear or a gear arrangement, which will rotate such a similar wheel or one nut. And rotating that nut is going to increase or decrease that pressure. And that is how the current to the motor is given on a controlled basis. So you get the requisite RPM. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Karthik, have you understood? Yes. Sir, how, sir. Do, how do we know uh, if this system misbehaves? How to deal with that? <laughs> when it misbehaves, you will deal with it. Misbehaving meaning what? It is initially calibrated. It cannot be, you know, at random fitted. They will calibrate it. They will test it. They will see what air pressure you are giving and whether it corresponds, corresponds to the fuel rack movement, fuel rack position. Ultimately, you are either giving an electrical si signal or you're giving a pneumatic signal to the governor. And that signal is going to rotate the spindle to control the spring pressure. Now, what can go wrong? Either some pipe is leaking or some leakage of current or the motor is not working. Why should it misbehave? It will not misbehave. If it misbehaves, you'll have to find out why it is misbehaving, where there is a leakage, where you're giving say 70 RPM here and you're going only 40 RPM there. Possibly the air is leaking out from your piston somewhere. So it is not able to give the requisite compression to move the fuel rack to the required position. So the force coming on the piston is much less. So why? Because some air is leaking out from that piston. So if there are leakages, then you can have misbehavior. In other words, what you want is not being correlated to what the fuel pump is giving. So that can happen. Yes, it can happen. So accordingly, you find out why it is happening. In the sense, you have to check for leakages. And there you will have a calibration chart. Because what is the pressure that is indicated? When you move the lever from 10 or 0 or 5 RPM to 50 RPM, it must correspond to the air pressure which is in the cylinder, which is in turn compressing this. If that air pressure does not correspond, it means there is some leakage or loss of air. So that loss of air has to be identified and then corrected, rectified. So if you get 5 kg pressure of the air, you know it is okay. And these are all calibrated during C trials. And the C trial reports will be available. And if at all you want to make changes, you will have to make changes and make entry in that retrial. So it rarely fails. It rarely fails. Now, if it is pneumatic, you need to only keep that air clean. Usually it is clean because it is controlled air, not directly from the air bottle. 
or rather it is from the air bottle but it goes through a separate filtering arrangement and oil drainage water drainage everything so clean dry air comes for these controls that is why the pipelines and valves all remain in good condition for the control system if you were to use the air ordinary directly from the bottle you will get dirt debris oil water everything inside so ultimately those pipes will be full of water which would be a big big problem so controlled air which is clean filtered dried air comes through these places and the chances of any mess up are very remote okay if there is a problem you will have like we had one time i will tell you the story it's a medium speed engine so and in fact that was the day i got promoted the day i got promoted and we had problems so it was i got promoted to chief in 79 1979 and came to the engine room we were supposed to leave mumbai harbor and they told us okay now you got your cargo push off push off and if anything you need for we were still not finished all our provisions coming on board and everything but the cargo work was completed so the next ship is waiting to come to the berth so you have to clear the berth and if you don't clear the berth you will be fined you will have to pay a very high toll fare so when we came to the engine room and we said let us try out the engine because it's a medium speed engine and it can decouch from the clutch when we started we give dead slow head and the whole engine speeded up to what it could 600 800 rpm and then trip So we couldn't understand why this happened. It was supposed to come up to the required idling speed and stop. It did not stop. It went full until the needle of the dial gauge could not go any further. There's a stopper needle. It got stuck there. But then the engine tripped. The whole engine shook as if there was an earth. Whole ship shook as if there was an earthquake. So then we tried immediately. We could not find what is the problem. again we tried again same thing happened then we said we are not going to do this put everything on manual manual control because there was a lot of automation even in 79 so then we put it on manual one follows operating the fuel one follows operating the air other follows are operating the cooling water all the engineers were there so then we somehow told the captain that okay once you start the engine don't stop because there will be three four operations required by three four engineers simultaneously it's confusing so they agreed so they gave dead slow ahead right at the start and they kept it at dead slow ahead and we moved out of the harbor and went to the anchorage in the anchorage we started searching what is the problem so we got to know that the governor this was the governor and not this but it was the governor which has to get a measured value and then when we give the engineers value it decides how much fuel to give that you have understood so now the measured value was coming not directly like this through a drive but through a electrical signal and that was a monitor the electrical monitor which was being driven by the shaft but it was generating a small current and that current was the input to the governor now how and where oil had leaked from top platform somewhere some motorman or junior engineer had dropped oil and he wiped that platform but that platform is not absolutely a oil tight platform there can be places where it will start dripping so that oil had dripped from top and it has fallen in that monitor monitor is more or less an exposed surface like a generator small tiny generator so it got full of oil so it was not generating any measured value to the governor and the measured value is what the actual value of the engine is now when the engineer gives a certain value the governor sees there is no engine is not rotating only but actually engine is rotating very fast but no signal is coming to the governor so the governor gives maximum fuel so it gave maximum fuel and ultimately it overspeeded and when the engine overspeeded there was a safety over trip device which tripped the engine that means it is completely separate from the governor 
So when we opened up that monitor, we found it is full of oil. So then we used electro cleaner to clean that whole thing. We didn't have any spare. So we cleaned that full thing thoroughly, put it back, and then ensured that the current will come to the governor. And then we started the engine. Lo and behold, it became perfect. To find the problem is about 75 to 90 percent of the problem. To rectify a problem in the engine room is 5 percent or 10 percent. But you need to identify where the problem is. You start your engine and this thing all over speeds. So after we rectified it, then we told the master, we are ready to move. So you couldn't believe it that in 20 minutes you fix something that you couldn't fix for two for half an hour in the port when it was an emergency. So he again tried out ahead, S turn, ahead, S turn, ahead, S turn, and then said, OK, let's go. So we moved off. The fault was in the monitoring device, which monitors the speed. And then it sends electrical signal to the governor. All right. And the governor gets electrical signal, much like the governor also gets the desired value as an electrical signal. It has a, I probably it has got a potentiometer or electrical devices. And then it gives an output to an electric motor. That electric motor will run a shaft which will have a bevel gear and a arrangement to turn this spindle here. That is purely mechanical. So mechanical movement of this will compress the spring. There is no electrical part over here. The ultimate governor can only be operated through flyweights. So these flyweights are what perform the function ultimately. So these flyweights will be having a counter force against the spring force, and the median position will, possess, will decide the position of the fuel lever. All right. So this is your concept of a mechanical governor. All right, we will go more into it because the engine does not have just a mechanical governor. The mechanical governor is the first concept that you need to make yourselves very clear about. So this is the principle on which all modern, up-to-date, all high-tech high governors will be working on. This is the basic concept. Flyweights, counterbalancing, a spring force. And whatever position it achieves, that position is inside the position of the fuel lack. OK. Karthik, are you better? Are you clarified with your idea right now? Yes, sir. OK. Let's move on. Actually, you know, I'll tell you one thing. You learn more about machinery when failures take place. If the machine is running fine and you simply lock down the temperatures and pressure, you don't really learn anything. Until a mishap takes place, unless a breakdown takes place, you go and investigate what happened, why the bush has failed, or there was a, too much of a clearance, what it was. And once you find out the problem, you eliminate that problem, and then you repair it. And you will see the learning experience is 10 times more then what a theoretical class like this can give you. It's, it's, and you will never forget it. You'll never forget a physical experience of having seen a breakdown in front of you, then identifying the fault which caused the breakdown. It is called root cause analysis. You have to find out what is the reason for its failure. Then remove that reason or attend to that reason and then do the repair. That is what distinguish, distinguishes you between an engineer and a fitter. A fitter will simply repair it and let it go. Again, after a few days, it fails. Again, he'll repair it and let it go. He will not find out what is the original cause, why it is failing repeatedly. But an engineer has to think in terms of first finding out the cause of the failure, then eliminating that cause, and then doing the repair. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to do any repair. Some breakdown, you repair it. Just repair is not enough. You have to identify the reason for the breakdown and eliminate that reason, and then do the repair. OK? So let's move on. The diagram shows engine in equilibrium state of speed. The centrifugal force arising through the flyweight 
and acting through the crank levers on the spring is balanced. That is why it is equilibrium speed. That means the fuel rack does not move to increase or to decrease. It is in a steady position. The speeder rod, which is the fuel linkage rod, which is fixed on the collar of the spring, is steady. So that is why you have equilibrium speed. Thus, the fuel rack is fixed position and the engine is at equilibrium speed. Quite understandable. It is when the load on the engine changes or when the engineer decides, I want more speed. This is not enough. So he gives uh, increased signal to governor. Governor sees the signal, asks for more speed. He will see what is the measured value. He say, no, the two of them don't match. I have to give more fuel to get that measured speed equal to what the engineer wants. So accordingly, he will give the fuel injection system a little boost to get the required RPM. And that RPM, once it becomes equal to what the engineer wants, you have equilibrium speed again. Okay. In the mechanical governor, the corrective action is made through compression or decompression of the spring. Okay. That is how you increase the fuel or decrease the fuel. In the diagram, a handwheel is shown as a means of changing the desired value or set speed by changing the compression of the spring. That handwheel is shown to show you that the spring compression can be increased or decreased. That's the whole idea of the handwheel. This handwheel or this handwheel can be replaced by electric motor or a pneumatic piston to enable operation from a remote location. What the handwheel does, electric motor can be made to do also. Likewise, what the handwheel does, what does it do? It simply compresses the spring and decompresses. You can use a pneumatic piston also to compress the spring or decompress the spring. So that will again change the RPM. So how much compression and how much decompression is the air inside that air piston is controlled from the control room. So that will decide what will be the position of the movement of the fuel rack. Okay. This handwheel can be replaced by electric motor or a pneumatic piston to enable operation from a remote cable. Okay. The ordinary mechanical the ordinary mechanical governor is insensitive and various equilibrium speeds are possible. That is, under different loads, different steady speeds can happen. So that is why it is very, very instable. And insensitive means unstable. It does not come to the required RPM very easily. Now, if there is a drop in load, that means there will be an increase in speed. And if there is an increase in speed, it means the flyweights are going to move out. The spring is going to be compressed. Fuel rack is going to be... Sorry, let's look at the diagram again. If there is a drop in load, the fuel, the, uh, there's going to be a drop. If there is a drop in load, the flyweights will move out. And drop in load means... For the same fuel, you will get a higher RPM. So if you get a higher RPM, these two are going to move outwards. All right. So moment they move outward, the speeder rod is going to move up. As it moves up, it is going to decrease the fuel. This negative, what you see, is going to decrease the fuel. If it decreases the fuel, RPM is going to come down. So the flyweights will again come back to their normal position. So whether it is increase of the RPM, or decrease of the RPM, it is these flyweights which are going to set the position of the fuel rack accordingly. Okay. Okay. The ordinary mechanical governor is insensitive and various equilibrium speeds are possible. Uh, that is, under different loads, different steady speeds occur. This is what is called a proportional controller. And a proportional control suffers from what is called offset. 
there will be a change from the original value for each time. An improved and better controlled governor is often in the form of a mechanical hydraulic governor. So if you make from a mechanical governor to a mechanical hydraulic governor, you get a better control and less of insensitivity, more of sensitivity at the same time it will give you stability and an improved governor in all, in totality. What happens in a mechanical governor? If for some reason the load increases, the RPM will shoot up. If it shoots up, the governor will immediately reduce fuel. So it will reduce the fuel to such an extent that it will be well below the required value. So then again what happens? The uh, spring force becomes much more than the centrifugal force. Moment the RPM drops very low, the centrifugal force will also be very low. Centrifugal force will be very low as compared to the spring setting. The spring will force that lever into the more fuel. The moment you give more fuel, RPM will come up again. In fact, in its process of coming up, it will go over the required value. So this to and fro movement of the governor linkage to cause excess fuel and again less fuel. Excess fuel is called hunting. And this hunting is quite common in the mechanical governor. To reduce this mechanical, uh, to, to reduce this hunting, we have a mechanical hydraulic governor with a arrangement to avoid or reduce hunting. Now let's have a look at it. The effort produced by the difference of the forces between the spring and centrifugal force to move the speeder rod is very small to move the fuel racks of a large engine. Yeah. Now, if you want very fine control, the spring force and the centrifugal force, the difference between the two will also be very small. And that little force is what moves the fuel rack. Now, if that force is very small, it may not move the fuel rack. So the fuel racks of all the engines will remain the same. So it will not move. So you need a little power where a small change in the RPM is required. And it will not be enforced by the small little effort in the difference of the spring force and the centrifugal force, which will move the fuel rack. You need something very, very powerful. You need muscle power to move the fuel rack. So if the difference between the spring force and the centrifugal force is small, it is not going to move the fuel rack. But there is a difference and a speed change is required. So we introduce muscle power. And this muscle power is called servo power amplifier. Okay. This extra power is achieved through a servo power amplifier or servo motor. Sometimes it is called servo motor also. What does servo mean? Slave. Slave and you are the master. You tell the slave, I want this. So he has the muscle power. He brings something heavy, carries it for you and brings it for you. All right. So you don't need to carry it. You don't have the muscle power, but you have the brain power. So you use your brains to tell the slave to do this. So he uses his muscle power to do a heavy job. The same thing with the governor. When that fuel lever moves, it moves with a very small force. And this force is called the effort. Effort of the governor. It is the difference in the force between the spring and the centrifugal force of the flyweight. If there is no difference, it means there is no effort. All right. So this effort is now used to control a pilot valve. Okay. All right. Now this pilot valve will ultimately control the servo power amplifier. So that is why this kind of a governor, which is a mechanical hydraulic one, is called a relay type of governor. Why? Because the that. Uh, the uh, speeder rod or the fuel load, it is controlling a pilot valve. Pilot valve is controlling the servo power amplifier. Servo power amplifier is controlling the fuel rack. So that is why this relay, this stepwise actions is called a relay. 
so the entire governor setup is called a relay type of governor okay any questions kartik or from anybody else do not hesitate to ask and get your concepts absolutely clear once you learn it you will never forget so ability to recall will be much easier but if you think i will get the link and i will mug it up for before the exam and i will rattle it off during exam you are bound to forget you will never remember but if you understand it then you will be able to explain it i would suggest explain to each other and improve your ability to explain a point the way it is required it will help it will definitely help so now this relay type of governor is what you see here now here is a block diagram one block in the dotted line is called the governor side and the other block which is in dotted line also is on the engine side your diesel engine is here and the diesel engine is running a certain load okay now suppose this load is having a certain value more than what was the original value so this diesel engine will be giving an output and that output will be fed back to the governor or part of the governor this governor has a measuring device and the measuring device is the spring the crank arms and the collar which will give you the measuring device so it gets a signal as a feedback from the diesel engine measured value and the engineer himself is setting a value which is a desired value if both these two values are the same then there will be no signal to change the the uh, position of the amplifier which in turn will change the position of the fuel injection system so if there is a change that means this feed measuring device getting the feedback from the engineer and from the engine finds there is a small deviation and that deviation signal is sent to the servo power amplifier the servo power amplifier uses its muscle strength to actuate the fuel control system or fuel control linkage and thereafter the fuel injection system it may increase the fuel so if the fuel is increased it will go to the diesel engine directly and increase the fuel so then the temperatures and pressures are running higher and <clears throat> you will get a improved performance because the response is immediate it does not have any delay in making changes for small values even if there is a small value change or a small deviation the servo power amplifier can take up that and create some change in the fuel injection equipment which in turn will give the diesel engine the required output as close as possible to what the engineer wants okay in fact you see some of these governors are so tuned well that you want 65.5 rpm you can set it to 65.5 rpm it is so so accurate very very accurate the modern attuned governors so this is the block diagram layout how a relay type of governor works the engine gives a feedback the feed and the desired value is also reached here the difference if any is the deviation and that signal is given to the servo power amplifier servo power amplifier if it gets a small signal also it will take action to give a bigger fuel injection once a bigger fuel injection is given the rpm will come up to what the desired value is okay sorry guys i am feeling very very sleepy wonder why i want to get there so here is an explanation to the block diagram a load increase will cause a speed drop moment you put resistance to the propeller the rpm will drop the measuring device gets the actual value and compares with the desired value from the speed setting control the deviation is then converted into an output which actuates the spa the servo power amplifier thereby increasing or decreasing the fuel to meet 
oh sorry this time it is increase thereby increasing the fuel to meet increase of load yes moment you have an increase of load the governor will arrange to increase the fuel you understand that's what happens in a rough sea when a sea is a rough sea means sea which has got lot of pitching of the ship you see the engine is racing what does it mean what it really means you see the governor also has a limit to how much it can perform and because of a lag in the output of the governor which is arising on account of inertia of the masses within when the propeller comes out of the water there is no load on the propeller so the propeller speeds up very fast and then when the propeller goes down in the water there is a lot of resistance so the rpm drops now moment the propeller comes out of the water and the speed shoots up the governor immediately reduces the fuel fine so it it tries to come to the required rpm but by then the ship has again gone down into the water and because the fuel is reduced and the resistance is included the rpm will even further drop so then the governor increases the fuel so once it increases the fuel okay it is coming up to the required rpm but then it comes out of the water and because the governor has increased the fuel and the propeller is out of the water the rpm shoots up so this continuous shooting up dropping shooting up dropping is a normal feature when the sea is rough the governor definitely tries to maintain the required rpm so it actually helps in reducing the amount of racing that's all but the racing will be there the slight amount of racing that means speed rise and drop rise and drop will be under some control it cannot be under total control which means if you expect the rpm to be 100 when it is out of water and exactly 100 when it is in water you are asking for the moon and you cannot get the moon that's the way it is so there will be some amount of fluctuation in the speed if the ship is pitching that means the propeller is coming out of the water and going back into the water out of the water back in the water because the load changing continuously and this load chain instills the governor to make a fuel change and there is a time lag between the two so there is some amount of racing okay now here is the mechanical hydraulic governor which will give the better control of the rpm now you see we have the same arrangement as what we saw in the flyweight governor only difference is the spring what you see here is a conical spring okay kartik has a question one minute just a sec guys let me get some water we take a 2 minute break i want to get some hot water for my throat oh there's a question so when starting air valve is in action governor rotates or stays in rest as fuel is not supplied during that period it is supplied simultaneously when the air starts moving and the engine start moving to a certain rpm at least it starts that is the time the air gets a lot extra fuel and it starts it is a combination between air and fuel at that point of time just a moment
Okay, guys, I have got my hot water. It's the advantage of working from home. You get your hot water and you can drink it in the office. It's not possible to ease your throat when you have to talk continuously. Yes, so Karthik had a question. When starting air valve is in action, governor rotates or stays in rest as fuel is not supplied during that period. Once the engine comes to a certain RPM, the governor immediately gives the fuel. And then <clears throat> even in the first unit that is firing, there could be air going in and then immediately the fuel also coming in for some time, momentary. So that is the way it is. It gets that initial starting air to give a little extra fuel to get that bus. And then again, governor steadies up. Okay. It is a coordinated action between the governor and the starting air, both. So let's have a look at this here. So the gov mechanical hydraulic governor is similar to what was there in the mechanical, ordinary mechanical governor. And only thing is the spring over here is a conical spring. This conical spring is used to give linearity. So the control action is proportional to the feedback. That is what it happens. Now here you have the spring which is pushing down the speeder rod and the plyweights again through bell crank levers is pushing that collar which is holding the speeder rod upwards. So there is a counterbalancing forces between the spring and the centrifugal force. And both of them are ultimately holding a speeder rod. This speeder rod, instead of directly controlling the fuel rack, because it does not have so much of power, so much of force, and to move the fuel racks, you require a lot of power. And believe me, you or me, we cannot do it by ourselves. Even if we use our maximum strength, we cannot. It requires enormous amount of power. So that power is achieved through amplification. How? So this speeder rod, what you see at the end of the speeder rod, there it goes into a hydraulic system. This hydraulic system consists of a pilot valve. All right. This pilot valve is operated by this speeder rod moving up and down. And the path of the oil which is coming, this oil comes from the sump inside the governor. The governor itself also has an oil container. That oil is taken by a small little gear pump. The gear pump pumps the oil through this passage. And the outlet of that gear pump also has a regulating valve. A regulating valve is a spring-loaded valve. So much so, if this path is closed, that regulating valve will release the oil and it will go back into the sump. Otherwise, the oil pressure will come here and stay up to here till such time this speeder rod moves down and allows the oil to pass through and come under this large diameter piston. This large diameter piston with the spring is called the servo power amplifier. You see, for a small pressure under the piston, and that piston has a very large area, the force will be amplified. In other words, the force will be definitely much larger than what the force is being exerted by this speeder rod. Okay, So this force of the uh, servo power amplifier, uh, this rod will go and move the fuel linkage. And that fuel linkage will again move in the positive or negative direction, depending on whether the oil flows under the piston or the oil is allowed to drain. If the uh, speed overshoots, if the RPM goes very high, what will happen? The flyweights will move outwards because the centrifugal force will also increase. And then if that happens, the whole piston rod, uh, this uh, speeder rod will move upwards. If it moves upward, it will block this passage and allow this drain oil to drain out. Moment the oil from under the piston drains out, 
the spring that you see there will be forcing this rod or piston downwards. Moment it is pushed downwards, it will reduce the fuel. Once the fuel reduces, the flyweights will come back to their normal position. Okay. So this is, you know, both sides it can work. Now, <clears throat> the important part is to reduce hunting. In other words, when this piston rod moves and the fuel linkage is increased, the RPM may shoot up more than what is required. So once it shoots up more than what is required, the flyweight will again move outwards much more. Moment it moves out much more, it will push up this collar against the spring force to lift the whole feeder, speeder rod. This is called the speeder rod. And once it lifts the speeder rod, again this will go down. So again this will come down. It will decrease the fuel. So this increase, decrease, increase, decrease of the fuel from the normal desired value is called hunting. So to avoid this hunting, you have what is called a feedback link. This feedback link is also called a speed droop arrangement. Now what happens? Now let's look at it again. Suppose the load on the engine increases, then the flyweights will move inward because the RPM will drop. Moment the RPM will drop, flyweights move inward, this speeder rod is going to go down. As it goes down, the pilot valve will open the oil passage to under the piston and piston will be pushed up. So in the process of pushing up the fuel lever, it is also moving the feedback link to decompress the spring. That means moment this point goes up, it will decompress the spring. Moment it decompresses the spring, what will happen? This speeder rod will come up. Moment it comes up, it will block any further oil going under the piston. So before actual fuel injection, increase in fuel injection takes place, action is being taken on the piston rod to stop moving any further. So this, is, this makes it much more quicker in taking action to reduce hunting. Which type of governing system is used for Bosch pump and valve controlled pump? See, these, I told you there are two types of governors. For the main engine, there will be no speed droop. For the auxiliary engine, there will be speed droop. So any of this, this can be used for main engine, this can be used for auxiliary engine, both. In the auxiliary engine, you will have a speed droop arrangement. This is that speed droop arrangement. Okay. Feedback link. All right. So this can be used for variable speed governor also, as well as for isochronous governor also. In reality, there is much more of linkages involved in the whole process to fine tune the governor movement. I have given you a very basic concept, very, very basic. I don't want to confuse you with much more of passages and pipes into it. This, as of now, is adequate for your main engine as well as your auxiliary engine. In the auxiliary engine, this becomes much more relevant. This feedback link, which is also called a speed droop link. Which type of governing system is used for Bosch type? pump and for valve control type, any, both. Both the pumps will have similar type of governors. It's just the setting of the governors that will make all the difference. And what is that setting? That setting here is dimensions of the pilot valve, the volume of this, the diameter of the piston, and more importantly, the distance from the fulcrum to the spring and the spring to the lever. You see, when this piston moves up, the spring is also going to move up. How much will it move up? It is dependent on this ratio of this feedback link. All right. So the speed droop or the adjustment is dependent on this fulcrum, where this fulcrum is. So on the governor itself, you will have a knob 
which will change the position of this either it comes closer or it can become bigger to change the rate at which this spring is going to give a feedback okay so it's a lot more complicated than this in real terms this first you try to get the basic concepts very clear then you can go into deeper concepts of there are many more passages of the hydraulic oil and i think i will give you one diagram which i have in my earlier note where it is a little complicated where do i got it now just to see i'll have to look for it notes let me see if i can get it right here it'll give you an idea of uh no no not this very tough to find i'll find it out later actual notes then in the 6th semester 6th semester i think ah uh, no man we'll come to it later okay we'll come to that that i have given to the previous batches and i have not given to this particular semester because i have noticed they never give that in the examination also never so it doesn't make sense going into deep studies and then not having the concepts now here is the diagram i don't know if you will be able to see it through the camera this is a little complicated diagram of isochronous governors and there's lots more to it then you have a full fledged governor where the actual item is then you have what is called the electronic governor this is the electronic governor that you will see and i will avoid giving you the complicated part of the governor because i notice ultimately the boys have no relevance in drawing that complicated diagram or explaining that you will not be required first get yourself well understood with speed group and the definitions but this is the most simplest diagram you can approach in an examination to let you explain what is a mechanical hydraulic governor all right there are many more linkages many more passages there is a compensating needle valve there is a needle valve which will keep a valve over here in this passage you can adjust the flow rate at which the pressure will act on this piston so there are so many more fittings included but this is the most basic concept and once you get hold of it the others will follow understand why this piston rod is fitted with the feedback link because when this piston rod moves the fuel lever it could it will give more fuel and that more fuel invariably results in more than what is required and then you have an overshoot to prevent such a thing to happen you have a feedback link which will immediately take action in not permitting this piston rod to move too much to give too much fuel and that is by having it linked to the to the spring which will reduce the spring pressure and thereby allow this speeder rod to come up and block any further oil coming under the piston so it is a, another closed loop system which avoids hunting hunting is same thing as racing of the engine so that is prevented by means of the speed group okay so get this concept very well clear do you have any questions on this particular on this particular diagram this can be used for your main engine also for your auxiliary engine also for your bosch pump also for your valve control pump also governor is governor ultimately what is the purpose of the governor controlling this fuel rack and i showed you in the valve type of governor Uh, uh, Karthik, 
that it had only one arm and that one arm was controlling the spill valve as well as the suction valve all right so spill valve suction valve was being controlled by simply one arm and that one arm was this this was the one arm all right so this is the arm that is coming from the governor okay kastavya has got a question so which type of governance is for bosch type of for both any any governor can be used for both of them usually u g h if you want the number it is oh i can tell you something little more about governor woodward governor company it is an american company orlando it is based in orlando and all over the world they have licensee manufacturers you can go and do a little research find out woodward governor company w o o d w a r d woodward governor company for main engines it is ug8 you can write it down on a piece of paper or uh, send a message yeah. woodward wood ward this is the company for main engines auxiliary engines have n number of models they have multiple number of models there are so many models maybe a hundred of them so each model has its own characteristic and accordingly they will choose the man the engine manufacturer will choose the governor for his company whether he is having bosch pumps or any other what are the lorange pumps or any other pump ultimately it is controlling the fuel pumps so the governor is the same okay let me move on the combined assembly of the spring and crank levers positioning the flyweight radii is regarded as the measuring device in a governa all right so it is the spring and the crank levers <coughs> positioning the flyweight radii is regarded as the measuring device in a governa because the governa has to have a measuring device and it has to have a means to give a signal or correction of deviation so it requires a system there the conical spring gives the spring rate which varies as the square of the governor speed you see the control action has to be in proportion to the speed so there has to be some linearity it is not that one third of my movement will give two thirds of that movement and vice versa that should not be the case it should be proportional so the conical spring gives the spring rate which varies as the square of the governor speed this gives linearity to the measuring system that means response is directly proportional to the change in speed okay whatever change in speed is there there has to be a proportional response so it requires some linearity so that is why you need a conical spring in place of a normal spring a normal spring if we load a spring with say 5 kilo it goes down by 1 cm all right now that same spring you load another 5 kilos will it go down by 1 cm it will not run it will 0.8 cm then as you keep adding weights one after another the amount of compression will be lesser and lesser and lesser till it comes to an end where much more than 5 kg will be required to give any compression but in the conical spring up to a certain limit of course if you give 1 kg it will go down 1 cm if you give another kg it will go down another 1 cm if you get one other cg it go down another cm so up to 3 cm possibly it will go down proportionally after that it will not be the same of course within a certain range 
it will have linearity. If the governor mechanism fails, it will shut down the engine. This is called fail safe arrangement. Now in a governor, what can fail? What can fail here? Mostly it is the oil pressure that is keeping this pressure up to keep the fuel rack in a certain position. Now, if this oil pressure fails, if some pipe ruptures or the gear pump, which is building up pressure fails to press up, if the regulating valve spring fails, the oil pressure in the system will drop. Or if from somewhere the gasket has leaked out, the oil will leak out. Moment the oil pressure drops means the governor has failed. And when it fails, when this kind of a failure takes place, this spring over here will force this piston downward and cause a zero fuel injection. And this zero fuel injection means engine will stop. It will not allow the engine to get full speed. It will not allow the engine to have become a runaway engine. Okay. So that is why every governor is designed with a fail safe arrangement. That is why I have written it in red that if there is any mishap, the engine will shut. If there is any mishap with the governor, well, the engine will stop. It will not go over speed. That is what is called fail safe arrangement. But I will tell you something more which is not told in books. What happens when this pin over here fails? If this pin fails, the linkage between the fuel rack and the servo power amplifier rod is disconnected. Now, that is not a governor failure. The governor failure is within the governor. Now, what happens when the failure is beyond the governor? If it fails from this link, the governor may give a signal to shut down the engine. But the fuel rack, which is under a different spring load in the maximum position, will automatically go into the maximum position. Because this pin is no longer holding, and over a period of time, this pin can get sheared off because it is the most neglected pin on board the ship. Nobody looks at this pin, and yet it is the pin that is holding the entire engine injection process by the governor. If this pin fails, you can have runaway engines. And if you have runaway engines, even the governor cannot help you because the governor can only put this rod down to stop the engines. But since this link is broken, even if this goes down, this fuel rack will not come to zero. So you have a condition called runaway engines. So what will you do? So Kartavya, what will you do if you have runaway engines? How will you stop the engine? No sir, by so by reversing, by giving uh, according to the firing sequence, we will uh, provide the uh, starting gear so that the uh, engine can be stopped. So, like the reversal process. Kartik, you cannot give fuel and air simultaneously. Fuel is getting into the engine. How can you give air? It is pilot valve is continuing in the same direction. So even if you give air, you are giving air more to boost the RPM. How can you give reverse? You need to stop the engine. How will you stop? You have got runaway engines. You can pull the lever, and that lever is connected to the piston rod only. And this piston rod, if you pull it down, it's not going to stop your engines. So how will you stop the engine? Somebody, Karthik, come up with some bright idea. Oh my god, we don't have much time. OK, think over it, and let me know, and let us proceed. So everybody understands what is fail-safe arrangement. Now, this is a diagram to show you how a conical spring behaves and how the ordinary spring behaves against the governor's speed and the spring rate. 
So you have a conical speed, conical spring, which is varying as per the governor speed, as the square of the governor speed. So that gives it some linearity. Other the ordinary spring, you do not have working. Working speed, assume increase of load in the engine. Oh, he's explaining how this mechanical governor works. Okay, flyweight, assume increase in load on the engine. That means resistance to engine has increased. So the RPM will drop. Moment the RPM drops, the flyweights move inwards. This moves the speeder rod downwards. Piston, pilot, pilot piston is lowered to allow oil or pressure act under the servo piston. Large area amplifies the force. Fuel lever move to increase the fuel to take the load. Feedback lever reduces the spring force to pull back the pilot valve. This reduces overshoot and consequential hunting of fuel lever and speed. The moment that servo power amplifier rod pushes the fuel lever, there is going to be a sudden increase in fuel. So while it is taking action to increase the fuel, there is also action to take the piston rod slow down or stop moving from increasing the fuel. So this reduces overshoot and consequential hunting of fuel lever and speed. In reality, there are a lot more controls within the governor. The rate at which the oil flows under the piston is also controlled. It is not that the pilot valve opens and the full pressure goes there. The rate through a compensating needle valve and that setting of that needle valve is also setting of the rate at which the fuel control changes. So there are a lot of controls and settings and adjustments that will ultimately match the governor with the engine. You cannot simply go and fit one governor and link it up with the fuel rod and it is done. That will not happen. You will get fluctuation of the speed. You will probably get over speed. There are knobs on the governor which you will need to adjust and that will help in setting up the matching between the governor and the engine. It, you cannot simply install a governor and link it with the fuel load and it is done. No. A lot of settings have to be put in. But those we are not going to go into. We will go into understanding the governor first. Okay. So this reduces overshoot and hunting. Since speeder rod does not have to move the fuel rack, it is very responsive minimizes delay between the load chain and fuel change in the closed loop. The servo power amplifier quickly and effectively provides the muscle to move the fuel rack. That you have understood already. To remove, to reduce or remove hunting, that is variation of the RPM above and below required value, speed droop is provided. Okay. This speed droop is provided only in auxiliary engines. It is not necessary in a main engines which is running the propeller. Okay. Main engine, there is not much of because you have always continuous change of the RPM when required. So here, what is speed droop? In governors, speed droop may be used to define the change in speed between no load and full load. This is in an isochronous condition. That means only isochronous governors will have speed droop. Now here is the graph. This is the full load condition. That means the, say 800 RPM. It is running at 800 RPM when there is no load on the generator. When there is full load on the generator, the RPM will drop by 2 to 3%, which means 16 RPM. That means 780 4 will be the RPM where the no load speed is 800. It is acceptable. It is accepted. And in between, if the load is half, maybe it will run up to 790, 95. So this is speed droop and it helps to reduce hunting. So in runaway condition, we can cut off fuel supply by turning fuel pump off. Karthik, that's a good answer, but I need more details. How will you turn the fuel pump off? Are you switching it off or are you closing the valve? How are you switching, turning the fuel pump off? 
Sir, suppose uh, we are having Bosch pump, so we can turn it to helical group part. So in that case, the fuel will not go into the engine. Very good. That's very, very close to the answer. But next time when we go to the workshop, you will notice on the engine below the Bosch pump, there is a cylindrical shaft protruding, small one, and with a square section end. This square section end is intended for a spanner. That spanner is always on the engine block with, with, with two clips, and it is supposed to be there. In most instances, that spanner is missing because the spanner is used for some other purpose and never returned. That spanner is used to cut off the fuel from individual units by rotating that spindle through 90 degrees. Moment you rotate the spindle through 90 degrees, a lever inside under the tappet of the roller comes in the way of the tappet, so the roller gets stuck in the up position. So the cam will keep rotating without making contact with the roller. So once the roller and the tappet which pushes the plunger up are locked in the upward position and not allowed to move, the plunger obviously cannot reciprocate or move up and down. If it doesn't move up and down, it is no longer pumping. And that is the fastest way of cutting off the fuel to a unit. So similarly, for the other units, you will have to go from unit to unit and one by one rotate that spindle through 90 degrees. Again, next unit, 90 degrees. Next unit, 90 degrees. So if you have runaway engines, the first time you cut off one unit, RPM will drop momentarily a little bit because instead of six units, five units are firing. One unit is not firing. You cut off the second unit, again, the RPM will drop a little. Third unit, again, it will drop. Fourth unit, again, it will drop. Till you come to the last unit where the RPM will definitely be much slower because only one unit is firing. There are answers which say, sir, we close the valve which leads the fuel to the engine. You see, by the time you close the valve to the fuel to the engine, there is fuel in the pipeline, there is fuel in the filter, there is fuel in the uh, manifold which has separate pipes coming to the fuel pump. Until all this fuel is consumed, the engine is not going to stop. So you need to stop it instantaneously, as quickly as possible. And the quickest mode of stopping it is cutting off the fuel pumps, which will cut off the fuel instantaneously. There are boys who say, sir, we will put a canvas on top of the turbocharger suction blower, so no air will go to the engine, engine cannot fire. You think there is a canvas cover waiting for you inside the turbocharger in the engine room when such a situation happens? And it is too late to go running to the to the workshop or to the store to fetch a canvas. And usually the canvas will be missing from where it is supposed to be there. So you need to be very resourceful in your activity in taking action when a mishap has occurred. There is no time to think. In your pocket, you must always carry three items. One is a shifting spanner. One is a screwdriver of reasonable size. And third is a torch. Because a torch is necessary, whether it is a morning, night, afternoon, anytime. Because if a blackout happens, the engine room is pitch dark. You cannot see your own hands. It's so dark. So you will need a torch. So with the spanner, you need to cut off all the units. And that is the best way of stopping. If you are not there inside that engine room at that point of time, there is invariably going to be a major mishap. And that mishap occurs with the bottom end bearing bolts breaking off. And you can imagine what happens after that. So let us proceed. So this is your speed group. And this speed group is largely involved with isochronous governors. Speed group allows an engine to run at a lower speed when the load increases and rated speed at no load. Just now you saw that diagram. At no load, it is running at the rated speed, whatever speed is there. Now at the full load, there is a drop of 2 to 3 percent, which is not much. And it is accommodated. And why it is accommodated, we will see just now. 
speed group allows the engine to run at a low speed when no load increases and latest speed at no load expressed as a percentage of original or no load speed speed group is equal to no load speed minus full load speed divided by no load speed which is equal to 2 to 3% now why is speed group required auxiliary generators require group main propulsion engines do not require speed group it is a setting within the within the engine to provide that speed group you see that feedback link is the means to give a speed group consider an engine with sudden load increase governor senses the speed drop and thereby increases the fuel now this paragraph is very important due to inertia of the moving masses fly weights crank levers springs speeder rod and friction of the rubbing surfaces it results in power lag in taking action instantaneously all right this causes overshoot of del fuel delivery to raise speed beyond the required original speed so the governor you may think it is very quick and very active and all that but there are factors within which does not give it the required speed of taking action ultimately it is a mechanical device ultimately the fly weights have to be there no electronic device can replace a fly weight movement centrifugal force and that centrifugal force is used to do the entire control of the governor the governor again responds to decrease of fuel to correct the overshoot if it then overcorrect and the speed reduction in the opposite direction causing undershoot that means the rpm either goes above the required limit or it goes below the required limit okay this overcorrection of speed in either direction which is instability will amplify until the engine trips on over speed so in a generator if you do not have group the engine is likely to go racing that side and again this side again that side till such time an over speed trip device completely separate from the governor will trip that engine so to overcome this problem of hunting and over speed speed group is introduced and implemented why auxiliary why in auxiliary generators and not in main engines auxiliary engines require constant speed to ensure steady voltage and frequency okay main engines require to run at various speeds so group is not a necessity auxiliary engines also use group to facilitate load sharing with other generators whereas main engine drive the propeller and do not require load sharing now you see in the auxiliary engine you may have two or three generators so the speed group settings of all the generators will have to be made more or less equal now with the same setting it does not mean that the generators will have the same speed group this is one quick factor you will come only through experience why because the inertia of the components of each of those items is a little different so if i set this at point 2 on the other generator i have to set it on point 2.5 on the third generator i might have to set it on 1.8 to give uniform speed group for all the three so the speed group setting does not mean i will set it at 2% here 2% here and 2% here and everything will work fine no this will be 2% that may be 2.5% that other one will be 2.2% and then every all the speed groups are same why because those components which are causing this over speed and under speed is the inertia of the component and each of those components inside the governor though they are machined to the same dimensions and etc when they are actually running they will show a little difference so this difference is very small but this small difference will ultimately result in one generator taking 65% of the load other one taking 30 
five percent of the load, or sixty percent of the load, uh, and let us say fifty-five percent of the load and fifty percent of the load. Though we are supposed to take fifty percent, fifty percent, but it might become fifty-five and forty-five. Why? Because the speed group settings are accurately by the digits, but not accurate by their characteristics. So the speed group has to be same in all the generators to have a balance of load. Okay, so that is why auxiliary engines use dup to facilitate load sharing with other generators, whereas main engine drive the propeller without uh, and do not require uh, load sharing. Oh my God, we are already in time. Next is definition. Sensitivity is a measure of its ability to control the speed of the engine within narrow limits. That means when an, a, a governor can bring the RPM very close to the required level without going too much of overshoot, it is considered as a very sensitive governor. A sensitive governor will have a large movement of the speeder rod for a small change in the radius of the revolving weight. So. If in the L crank lever, the horizontal strip of the crank will be very large, and the vertical strip of that crank will be very short. So a small movement of the flyweight will give a large movement on the control rod. But then you will have a diameter of a governor which is very large, which is not worthwhile. So we have an idea. Effort. The resultant force between the spring and the centrifugal force on the speeder rod is called the effort. No change in load means no change in speed, and therefore effort is zero. It is the difference between the spring force and the centrifugal force. If there is no, if there is equilibrium speed, there is no effort. First of all, stability. A governor is stable when there is only one radius of rotation of the flyweights for each speed at which the governor operates within the speed range of the governor. That means it is very, very stable. That is, even if there is a change in speed, there will be no change in fuel. So it is very stable. You don't want too much of stability. It's like a lethargic governor. A lazy governor will be called a very stable governor. As a mechanical centrifugal governor becomes more sensitive, it becomes less stable. Sensitivity and stability are opposite characteristics in a governor. That means you need to have sensitivity and you need to have stability, both in the required proportions to give the best output. Hunting. When load changes, governor takes action to increase or decrease the fuel. This results in overshoot and undershoot of the fuel delivery, and therefore the RPM till equilibrium is reached. This is called hunting. I don't need to explain hunting to you. It is generally overshoot or undershoot of the median value that is desired. Feedback: the response of the three-point lever in the fuel control by the movement of the SPA is referred to as feedback. This helps in reduce hunting. I explained to you before the servo power amplifier can give too much fuel, it is immediately controlled and not allowed to give too much fuel. So that is what helps in controlling hunting. A safety feature in large engines over and above the distinct and distinct from the governor is the overspeed trip device. Now I explained to you. Uh, that ship we had, we started the engine and the whole engine went to 600 RPM, and then it tripped. That had this overspeed trip device. If and when the speed of the engine exceeds the maximum rated speed by 15%, the trip occurs. The engine stays shut and cannot be restarted unless reset. Now, if the engine speed goes 15% more than the maximum rated speed. The tripping device comes into action, and it will stop the engine. It is completely separate from the governor, and it has to be reset to restart the engine. It is there in some engines; it is not there in the other engines. It is up to the manufacturers, particularly located on the camshaft extension. 
Now I have given a diagram here of an overspeed trip device. This is the extended part of the camshaft. It is a little larger diameter, and this is the axis. And within that, there is a machined path inside, wherein a bolt is fitted. This bolt is fitted with a collar and a spring held in place by means of a nut, and that nut has a split pin. The entire assembly is within the periphery of the diameter of the camshaft at the extended portion. Now, the centrifugal force that arises in this bolt is largely dependent on the center of gravity of that bolt. The center of gravity of that bolt is located quite offset from the central axis. It is here. And because the center of gravity is here, when the shaft rotates, this bolt will have a tendency to shoot out from its position, compressing the spring. But it will not do so till it reaches 15% of the excess of the rated speed. That setting is done by compressing the spring by this nut and locking it in position. So when the speed goes 15% above the maximum rated speed, this lever that you see is actuated. This lever is actuated and it is pivoted at this point. So this catch will be released. Moment this catch is released, this collar, which is under a spring force, and it is holding the lever, which is connected to the fuel racks, all the fuel racks, or the fuel lever, that will be released. So this spring force is a very heavy spring force and is capable of pushing the fuel rack to shutdown condition. So the fuel racks will stay shut down. Now the engine will not start because the fuel racks have been put to zero and this has kept pushing it. So unless, unless you come and pull this fuel rack back in position and put this catch on into the place, the fuel rack, fuel pumps will not work. So once this reset button has been pulled back and this catch has been locked in position, then only can you restart the engine. All right. So that will be all for today. I can see your time is nearly, nearly 20. And as for your attendance, there are 36 boys here, which means how many are absent? So let us have a quick look. Eight. This is section C. Section C has got seven, eight, seven, nine. Eight zero is missing. Eight zero, eight zero, eight one, eight two, eight three, eight four, eight five, eight six, eight seven, eight eight, eight nine. Eight nine is missing. Eight zero, eight nine, nine zero, nine one, nine two is missing. Nine. Two nine three nine four. Karutharan, are you nine five? Yes, sir. I'm nine five. Nine five. Karutharan, nine six nine seven nine eight nine nine one two. Kundan Kumar Sharma, or eight one zero two. Yes, sir. Okay. Eight three eight one. Okay. Three four five six seven eight nine ten is missing. Eight one one zero. 110 11 12 13 uh, uh, mrtunjay kumar rana what's your number 14 sir 14 so 813 is missing 13 is missing 14 15 16 17 okay that will be all so absentees are 8080 8089 8092 8113 which is inclusive of withdrawn cadets Okay, so that will be all. If you have any questions, you can send me by WhatsApp because the last part of our class has been a little hurried because the time is almost over. So if you have any questions, sir, Malta Shipping Company. What is this? Somebody said something. Sorry. Where is the chat column? Sir, Malta Shipping Company is Indian company. How can Malta Shipping Company be Indian company? That shipping company's head might be an Indian, like Prabhat Jha. He is the head, the uh, CMD or whatever, of MSC. And MSC is based headquarters in Cyprus. So it doesn't mean it's an Indian company. So the head of the Malta shipping company may be uh, Indian. But Malta shipping company cannot be in India. If it is registered in India, then it's an Indian company. Can be considered as an Indian company. Otherwise, it is not an Indian company. Why are you getting some feelers from there? 
good if you have explore definitely you explore all opportunities wherever they are possible okay so that will be all for now other i will get a scolding for holding you up for your next class okay take care bye bye